All right. So, um, welcome. Thank you. Janet from Passion Folk, who we've invited in here to the Ovkin studio to talk all about how to discover your brand archetype. And I think later on, Ovkin are going to be doing a little bit of discovering ourselves. So yeah. we're going to see what, what where Janet thinks that we sit and, and where we think we sit. Um, and hopefully you'll be doing that too as we work through all these archetypes. So we're really excited to have Janet here with us today. Um, we've been planning this webinar for months. So it's, yeah, um, we have actually. Yeah, yeah. We keep bumping into each other all over the place in parks. And it's like, right, we've got to sort that out. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Janet because there's no one better than the person themselves to talk us through um, your experience and, you. and where you've worked and, and hence why we've got you in here as our brand archetype expert. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I've, I've had a, a long career in marketing uh, brands across across Australia, um, both based in Sydney and in Melbourne. Um, I have marketed beer brands predominantly as well as um, dairy brands. So Your just, husband must have loved that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always used to think it was it, my career matched my life stage. So <laughs> beer was all, you know, what you I was younger. all about when I was younger and then I moved into marketing milk. Um, <laughs> so here are dairy farmers milk for a couple of years and that was when I had my twin boys. So... Yeah, I um I worked in those companies for quite a long time. Um, I worked overseas in uh, media strategy in the UK, again planning strategy for beer. Um, <laughs> then I decided to take the leap and um, start my own business when I uh, decided that I wanted to balance my family life with my career. Yay. So yes, yeah, so Passion Folk was born. Um, we relate to that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. And uh, Passion Folk was born a couple of years ago, and uh, we we're now a team of three um, with various um, contractors that work with us and we work uh, with brands across categories across Australia. So we work in skincare and alcohol and education, um, sailing, yacht clubs, yes. uh, that sort of thing. So <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's wonderful um, and I really enjoy the variety of being able to uh, employ my skills uh, with various clients every day. Fantastic. And I think one of the benefits too is that, and, and all of us sort of having come from larger corporates, We've had that exposure to the really rigorous marketing techniques and strategies and theories Absolutely. and to then be able to provide that to smaller businesses so they can yes. get exposure to that without having to fork out a huge amount of money to, <laughs> exactly. to employ someone to do that for them. Absolutely. So, yeah, years and years of sort of using these techniques means that I, you know, I'm very quick to, to use yes. them as, as you would be as well. So it's great to be able to share that with people that um, haven't been exposed to it. Yeah. So one of the things we, we say a lot and, um, in our workshops is that it's no wonder people get overwhelmed because marketing has changed more in the last two years than it has in the last 50. And having been, we could almost call you a veteran in marketing. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, we call ourselves yes. veteran in the digital world. So yes. we're, oh, yes. all, we're all part right. of the yeah. same term. Um, how have you seen marketing change since you started out in the beer days to how it is now? Because there's a big, big... Yeah, transformation has absolutely. Happened. So when I started, um, the segments were not as um, co as complicated. So there would be only fewer brands in each segment, and then those brands um, were basically the way they spoke to their consumers was dictated by marketing budgets. Mm -hmm. So these brands might have a TV ad or at some sort of advertising and their packaging, but that was pretty much it. And now there's been a proliferation of, of channels, um, so uh, using social media in particular, where consumers want and expect to be able to connect with brands on their own terms. Mm -hmm. So therefore brands, um, and as a result of that, uh, there are many, many more brands in pretty much every segment. So, yep. um, and they all meet different needs while selling the same products generally um, because they connect with people in different ways. Yep. So yeah, as, as consumers uh, expect, um, expect brands to behave in a certain way. And I guess that leads into to what Archetypes is all about. Mm. So yeah, because if a brand suddenly got to decide what their behaviour is and, and, and who they are and their personality is because that's what consumers want, then you've absolutely. got to do the hard jobs and work out what you are. Absolutely. That's exactly right. And, I mean, that ties in so much with our philosophy about knowing who you are so that you can attract your tribe because you're not for everyone. No, mm. you cannot be for everyone and nor, sh nor should you be. Mm. To be to be authentic and, and strong um, as a person and as a 
person's character and as a brand, you need to stand for something um, and you will attract the people that, that you need to that way. And the moment that you start trying to be all things to everybody, you come across as very um, schizophrenic or confused yeah. and um, people just can't latch onto that and really connect with you the way they, they should. Yep. Mm. Great. So should, yeah. we, should yes. we dive in? Yes. Let's do it. All right, let's go. So discover your archetype. Holding right. on. Okay. So this, um, basically up on the screen is a diagram which explains um, or lists all of the different archetypes. There are 12 and uh, they're based on the theory um, by, by Carl Jung who is a, a who was a, a an and the who founded analytical psychiatry. Basically, his idea was that there are 12 main characters in life and in any story, and we recognise those characters and their stories across cultures and across time. Um, so these characters and stories are embedded in our, our consciousness as humans, and mm. it's just as relevant to me here in Australia as to somebody in India or, you know, somebody 100 years ago. We recognise these stories and characters. Um, so in terms of how that translates to purchasing behaviour, yeah. um, emotion, intuition, uh, long-term memories and our un unconscious motivations make up as much as 80% of our decision-making process. Wow. 80% unconscious. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the old limbic brain that yeah. we talk about. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're actually in a supermarket and you recognise, you're looking at the brands and there's, you know, 20 different brands of shampoo, for example, um, how you connect with, you don't necessarily um, make all your purchase decisions rationally. You might you know, need it in terms of price or, mm. um, or what they actually do functionally. But uh, there's a lot more that goes into play and it's about how that brand actually is presented on the shelf and what it is actually saying to you on an unconscious level. And that makes up a lot of your purchase, purchasing decisions, basically. Yeah. So brands are like characters. They are the personification of a product or a service or a company. They tell their stories um, by their packaging, their advertising, the colours um, and the words that they use. And they really have personality and character um, and, and reputation. So there's a lot more than just a logo on <laughs> a shampoo bottle yep. when, you, when you're making that decision. So, so yeah, if you recognise what that brand is about or what that story is about, you develop an, um, a subconscious perception of it. You don't need to see hundreds of ads to get it or you, need, you don't need to see it again and again and again. You'll recognise it and if you identify with what it's saying, then you're more likely to be connected to it. So that's, that's the idea um, behind, the, behind what an archetype is. Um, brands use archetypes to tell their story, uh, to shape their future and to differentiate from other brands in the same category. So there are a lot of shampoo brands and there are a yeah. lot of, you know, basically if they're all saying the same thing, then we wouldn't buy most of them because you wouldn't need to keep looking for something that connected with you. So yeah. using that shampoo analogy <laughs> quite a bit. Well, we can all identify. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we all buy Well, my shampoo. husband's bald, so maybe not. <laughs> That's a whole other category in its own. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so basically... Um, an example, and we've been, we were talking about this the other day. Yes. And I remember saying this in the early 2000s, back when, um, when Br Britney Spears was in her heyday and there was, um, you know, there's Avril Lavigne and Christina Aguilera. Yeah. I used to always say, look, they're saying the same thing. They're absolutely saying the same thing. They're just doing it in different ways. Mm -hmm. So Britney Spears was all the innocent before yes. she changed. <laughs> um, she was all about being innocent. Yes. <laughs> The schoolgirl kind of references, and yeah. Avril Lavigne was all about being a rebel, and yeah. you know, the skater girl. Yeah. And then there was Christina Aguilera, who was you know gyrating away, yes. being a, a lover. Yes. Um, but essentially, they were selling uh, female, you know, pop music. Yes. And, you know, the, the songs weren't that different from each other. But that's yeah. an example of how selling the same thing but doing it in a different way will help yes. you connect with a different audience. Yep. So now, why don't we have a, have a discussion about each of the different archetypes? Yeah, that's yep. right. That's exactly where we want to go. Fabulous. All right. So first up, I'm going to talk about um, three archetypes which are all about stability, seeking stability and structure. So these stories or characters help you to, um, to basically uh, seek stability in, in the world. Um, the first up, first up, I want to talk about the creator. Uh, the create, uh, sorry, the caregiver, sorry. The caregiver is one of the most powerful and positive archetypes there is. 
Um, so the caregiver is driven by the need to protect and care for others. They're compassionate, generous and strong. Um, caregiver brands uh, promise recognition of service. So they're very they're pure, they're natural, they're gentle, they're about looking after other people. They help us as consumers to balance the, the pressures of modern life, being busy and being quite selfish, you know, quite yeah. inward focused, um, with the desire to look after other people, which is a sort of an innate human and it, thing. And it's so true when you think, well, I haven't got time to, you know, go and do this, but if I buy, thank you, yep. then at least I'm doing my bit, Absolutely. even though I haven't got the time. I would love to be able to help people in other countries who really need access to fresh water or mm. hygiene. Mm. Love that idea, but, um, you know, I can't really do much about it. Mm. And I'm really busy right now yeah. as well. Yeah. So, so the thank you brand of hand wash and food and that's food right. that's all contributes its profits to um, solving problems in developing countries. Yes. That brand, that thank you brand is would be a caregiver brand. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. So so as, as you said, the sale of every product goes towards supporting those less fortunate in other countries. Um, and you can track your purchase and mm. the project that it's funding. So therefore there is recognition mm. of what you've just done and what you know yeah. how you are actually helping uh directly it's so um, clever they've really closed the loop absolutely on, you know of, of being able to track your impact that's mm. right yeah and engage you in the process exactly so all their advertising is about facilitating the connection between you the consumer and the needy um and it's very positive it's compassionate and strong um and the packaging is quite no nonsense it's not mm. frilly it's not mm. over the top it's very much this is a product this is a, a hand sanitizer and it's going to help people find um, or have access to clean water in another mm. country um, so very very sort of um, straightforward but extremely um, gentle as well mm. I haven't seen them actually do too much advertising per se I think a lot of it is um, viral a lot of it word is. of mouth and it is. Um, people sharing their experiences and I know I mean they were funded by a, a, um, a crowd funding campaign in the yes. very beginning and that's how they've managed to grow so you know that's when you tap into something that has a higher purpose yes. people want to tell other people about it absolutely mm -hmm. yes there is nothing negative um, about that brand at all or about being associated with it at all yeah. um, so for if your brand if you think your brand is is a caregiver brand um, you really need to look at promoting protection safety and support um, how you can actually how you can support your customers um, don't be aggressive or harsh in Anyway, don't don't be flippant. Um, just be, just think about your brand about its service to other people. Mm. I suppose. Mm. Great. Um, and then the next next up is the ruler. So the ruler is di driven by the desire for power and control. So it's not necessarily a, a negative thing, or mm. it sounds like it. But the ruler is very confident, responsible, and fair. They're very solid and polished, um, and they promise power. So. Mm. You, if you buy this product, you're on a winner. You're, yeah. you're definitely on a winner. There's no two buts about it. Yeah. Um, so a brand that I think fits this archetype very well is L'Oreal. So, so, and you're going to use skincare brands I'm going to, in, yes. in this whole example. Yes, yeah. I should have yeah. explained that first. <laughs> I thought I'll use the skincare um, category, category so that you can see how different brands promote different things, mm -hmm. although ostensibly they're not that different in terms of what they're actually selling. Yes. Yeah. Skincare. Yeah. Um, so L'Oreal is a ruler, in my opinion. It's ubiquitous. It's got very wide distribution mm. all mm. across the world. It's through very many different channels. Um, it's got very heavy advertising, big budgets. Um, it's quite innovative um, in in its categories. It's very no nonsense, and it's not flowery or overly feminine. Even though it's selling very feminine products most of the time, mm. um, it's very much. We are the you know we are the ruler, and mm. this is this is the way that the category is. So mm. um, there's a lot of uh, strength to be taken from that, and um, if you feel um, supported, I suppose. Yep. The um, if you've got any questions, no, I was just going to say like um, when I think of L'Oreal, I think of their hero campaign, which is "You're Worth It." Yes, which is very directive, very strong, no nonsense, and it's and it's it get it got a lot of cut through. Yep. I think because it was just short punchy to the point mm -hmm. and very aspirational yes yeah mm -hmm. and it's almost like you don't argue with us there's no yeah. there's no yeah. need to argue with that sentiment so yeah. and yeah. very strong all the time so yeah. um so i think that is a rule of uh the creator brand i have um i've got their hand wash at home <laughs> <laughs> it's great I, I love growing up from it. yes. so i love the packaging i love i love what it stands for and i think they do a very good job um 
in a marketing capacity. Um, but the creator brand is driven by the need to produce the exceptional and the enduring, and it's quite afraid of being mediocre. So mm -hmm. polished products, um, very much ensuring that whatever it actually is responsible for is mm -hmm. good quality, is top quality. Um, so creator brands promise innovation, so something new. Um, they, uh, they promote imagination, expression and innovation. Mm -hmm. So if your brand is a creator brand, it's all about being a little out there, pushing the boundaries. You don't have to stay with the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, it's about, you know, what can you do that's, that's different, that's going to add value to people. Um, and in terms of, it's still a stability archetype because it's not about upsetting the apple cart. It's about creating something new for everybody to enjoy. Mm. Um, so in terms of Grown Alchemist, it's an organic skincare brand. It's unique, um, it's very recognisable packaging, almost illegible font, so mm. you need to really look at it properly. It's quite beautiful and it releases new products regularly mm. and in different types, in different sort of areas as well. Okay. And it's aligned with innovators in fashion and you know, retailed on Netta Porter and things like that. Mm. So very much about you know connecting with creative people is what they're trying yeah. to do as well. Mm. Great. So that was the stability archetype quadrant. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Moving yes. on. I'm down. <laughs> uh, next, um, I want to talk about achievement archetypes. So these are basically at odd, almost at odds with the the previous ones. These are the the archetypes that really want to create new boundaries or will break the boundaries and basically create new ground. Um, the first one I want to talk about is the rebel, which makes sense in, the, in that regard. So the rebel is driven by revolution and it's free spirited, it's brave and it's adaptable. Um, rebel brands promise liberation and freedom from the status quo. They just don't want to be constrained yeah. to what, what's going on currently. Um, so the brand that I've picked out is Urban Decay. Uh, They've, it's a, it's a, it started off as nail, nail polishes, I think. Yeah, um, now there's a whole yeah. lot of different, oh, it's, it's quite big now. I've probably um, seen it everywhere now. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, you're obviously not their customer. <laughs> no, clearly not. You're not the Avril <laughs> Lavigne <laughs> <Avril Yeah>. <laughs> customer. I <can't> <laughs> well, they, they've got, the, their lipsticks are called things like blackmail, brat, criminal. Oh, um, that's why. You know, it's just. <laughs> I wouldn't buy anything. One of their, um, their, Ambassadors is Ruby Rose, who yeah. is you know who's gay. She's tattooed, yeah. you know, absolutely That's gorgeous. Yeah. But she's not you know your, your traditional model no. who's you know yeah. yeah very vanilla. She's out there doing her own thing, and she really identifies as a rebel. Yeah. So I guess if your brand, if you if you are thinking of your brand as a rebel, what you uh, could do is promote yourself as an alternative to the mainstream. Make an effort to really stand out. So think about what's going on in your category, and then trying to do something different mm -hmm. yeah. zig when everyone else is going <laughs> zigzagging yeah. yeah um so you know be unconventional and unique and even a little bit shocking so yeah that that's what it really does um and the thing is with rebels rebels attract people that really enjoy what they stand for yeah. so they get some very you know cult-like following yes yeah. so um the, the next one is, the next archetype is the magician. So the magician is all about using imagination. Um, they are basically about understanding the, the universe and their place within it. They want to, they want to take it, transform things and, you know, take an, a new take on something, I guess. They're very driven and charismatic and they can help their customers become wiser. I suppose. Mm. So transferring their knowledge to other people. Um, magician brands are all about promising power and they're often related to um, contemporary products and transformative products. Mm -hmm. So you've used Ultraceuticals here. I have. Which is a fairly um, technical it brand. It is, yeah, yeah, it is. And on a, the reason technical why... Technical skin care? Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's, That's right. That's a bit of category. Yeah. 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 The reason why I've done it is because it was its story. It was founded by um, Dr. Jeffrey Heber, who's a cosmetic physician, and he was probably one of the first of scale to really create a brand that was big, you know, really saying that department store brands don't really do much. You really need some clinical mm. active ingredients. You need science, proper science, yeah. and, you know, you know, basically move away from, you know, buying what's on the shelf yeah. because I don't think, I don't believe in that as a doctor. And mm. then you... So basically, he's about transferring his wisdom to um, to to his customers yeah. and and really giving them something that is 
different to what was currently on offer. Mm. So that brand has grown very large now. Yeah. Um, so it is almost, you know, but they're at risk of losing that, I guess, that idea that they are a magician because yes. they've become so big. Yeah. But mm. where it was really rooted is, you know, really trying to, to do something different and um, transform the idea of what skincare is. Mm. And it's interesting, isn't it, because in each of these scenarios that we've already presented, where you actually see them where you see these products placed. Mm. Like I know when I've gone and had my laser <laughs> therapy, they are selling things like ultraceuticals. Mm. They're selling very technical kind yes. of skincare. Yes. Whereas, um, you know, I could go to, I guess, um, a chemist mm. and get um, one of the other brands, like Grown Alchemist I've seen and, yes. and a chemist. Mm. So, yes. you know, it, the positioning of where they see themselves also Absolutely. portrays what their archetype is communicating and, Absolutely. and who it's reaching. It's all the touch points. It's how they're communicating, whether they're doing, you know, big TV ads. Urban Decay is definitely not doing that. They're, yeah. they're definitely, you know, focused on social media and yeah. digital communication because yeah. their tribe has found them that way and yes. that's how they connect with them. Yeah. But you, you're not likely to see big mainstream advertising because that's not yes. what Rebels do. Do, no. yeah, they're not no. mainstream. Then they're not Rebels anymore. No. Yeah. <laughs> Until it becomes mainstream to be a rebel. I yeah, mean, you know. yeah. And they, they're going to do something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and then the next one is the hero brand. So, in, so we're still in the achievement archetype. So this is the third one. So the hero is all about uh, basically proving their worth, being brave, determined and skillful. Um, a hero brands promise mastery or triumph. Um, so they're all about um, promoting their quality and the fact that they're superior to their competition almost the fact that they can, you know, save the day as well. And um, the one that I like to think of as a hero is Napoleon. Um, first and foremost, because Napoleon, the, the man, is very um, front and centre in all of his branding. Um, he likes to position himself as, you know, as the creator behind it. Um, he, his products are about saving the day. You know, he's got advertising that says not to prime is a crime. And, you, know, <laughs> you know, he has makeup schools where he's training masters. He's te yeah. teaching people to be able to, you yeah. know, use these beautiful products yeah. and, and make other people beautiful. So he, he's kind of leading the way, I yeah. suppose. Um, you know, he, the packaging is very strong. It's black and mm. gold. It's very premium. It's, again, um, very, very confident. So... Mm. So yeah, that's that's what I would imagine a uh, a good example of a hero brand in that category. Is. Excellent. Well, I wonder if anyone's getting like any little vibes about where they might be sitting yeah. in their brand. Oh, you're probably like me, Marie. Doing like, oh, but I'm a, we're a bit we're a bit yeah, of that. Can be a bit of a rebel. I can be a bit of a rebel. Oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm just I was just saying before. I think. These archetypes are, you know, based the basic ideas and structures for, for brands to operate in. And, but brands are quite like people and people mm. aren't always the same. In every single situation, mm. every minute of the day, you're not going to always behave like a rebel. There are yeah. going to be times when you must be conventional or you must, mm, yeah. as an example. Um, but it's just the way it is. And people have bits and pieces of, of everything, but yeah. it's the overarching thing that, mm. that we're, we're talking about. Yeah. So we're on to the next quadrant, the belonging, belonging. archetypes. So these are brands that help you belong um, and feel connected uh, to, to, to the world. The first one is the regular gal or guy. Um, and this brand is all about um, wanting to belong and feel part of something. So it's very friendly, empathetic and reliable, very familiar. Um, it promotes honesty and dependability. So regular gals, um, Promise belonging. They they really are based on the ethos that everybody matters just as they are. You're okay, and we're okay. So we're not trying to change you. Um, we're just going to to tell you what how what, what we stand for and why we are just perfect for you as you are. Yeah. Um, so very much about being honest and dependable. And I think a brand that really um, demonstrates this well is Dove. So it's very, it's got very accessible pricing. It is, you know, fairly ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, very basic products. Um, you know, they'll have some innovation, but it's they're not too fancy in that regard. Um, they're all about promoting healthy self-esteem. So we're all beautiful. If you remember that campaign yeah, they did, was which good. was yeah, wonderful, went all around the world. And it was all about, you know, we as women are are fine. Yeah. Um, so we're in this together, and don't be sucked into the hype. You know, just you know. Feel, feel strong in that you're part of the bigger, you know, humanity and you're okay. Yeah. Um, 
So the next one is The Joker, and I, I, this is one that I enjoy. Everybody would enjoy, I, I assume. Um, the Joker brand is all about driven to live in the moment and enjoy life. It's all about being joyful, carefree, and original. And what they promise is just enjoyment. Um, so a brand that I think really resonates in this regard is Go To by Zoe Foster Black. Ah, it's, I didn't know that brand, but now you said that, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, very, very funny. If you follow mm. it on Instagram, it's all, follow her on Instagram, she's hilarious. Yeah, I was um, going to say her personal account oh, over her brand account is, I mean, they're both wonderful. Yeah. But well, she's a, it's a really good, um, I guess, articulation of how a brand replicates the person. Yes. She's yes. very much like this. Yeah. She seems, you know, joyful, carefree quite pure. She doesn't seem like she's got a bad bone in her body. Yeah. Hilarious though. Married to a comedian. Absolutely. Who's also very, <laughs> yeah. who's also great as yeah. well. In the um, pocket there. Yeah. yeah. So um, in terms of that brand, it's it's very um, funny and irreverent. It's got very playful packaging. It's the opposite of serious. It's mm. white with, with peach. Um, it's not trying to be super technical, yeah. even though they it is a, a quality brand. Yes. But they don't bang on about that. It's more about having fun and you know, giving you the reason to smile. Yeah. So there's, it's about enjoyment. Just um, yeah. And if you go to their Instagram account, like you can see that there are yeah. people smiling and absolutely you know, fun words and yeah. yeah, yeah. And so if your if your brand is like is a Joker brand, um, it's all about promoting living in the moment, using fun language, um, reveling in silliness. So yeah. sharing when you're being silly or the yeah. brand is, yeah. you know, funny moments. It's just about enjoying life and not being too serious, because there are other times for that. Yeah. The other brands can do that. Yeah. <laughs> and then the last one in this uh, belonging set of archetypes is the lover. Now, the lover is driven by experiencing pleasure, um, very passionate, magnetic and premium, um, and love, lover brands promise intimacy. But it's not just passion and it's not just being sexy. Um, they promote a love of life um, or the product or each other. It's about connection in a much more intimate way. Um, so really what they're about is longing for a, a better world. Mm. And um, if your brand is sort of in this realm, it's about promoting the senses, the feeling that your product provides. Yeah. Um, you know, you can position it as glamorous or aesthetically pleasing, sensuous or rich. Um, it's very much about helping people enjoy mm -hmm. and um, to, the, to the nth degree, I suppose, yeah. in terms of um, the, the, the five senses. Um, so a brand that does that, I think, is MAC. MAC has beautiful, iconic black packaging, very rich colours, um, very... You know, sort of rich in, um, imagery as well, quite yeah. intimate, as uh, the way that they photograph all of them, you know, their character, their models and mm. their, their ambassadors. Um, very, um, very sort of sexy in-store presentation as well. So, and it revels in the sensuality of people across the world and across demographics as well and sexual persuasion. And they're not saying this is all about, you know, white females. Yeah. Um, it's all about people of all different Mm -hmm. different walks of life yes. um, is who they put up in their advertising and it's all about tapping beauty and really owning it. Mm -hmm. This is what we stand for is a, a beautiful world yeah. and we're going to make you feel beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's for you or for somebody else, this is you know, yeah. this what we do. Yeah. So Awesome. The last quadrant. The last one is freedom. I'm so looking forward to this one. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. So freedom um, archetypes are all about, um, again, I guess again, moving away from the status quo as well. It's all about being individual and seeking, you know, a way to express the indiv your individual self, I suppose. Um, the first one I want to talk about is the innocent. And the innocent um, is all about the desire to be free and happy and the biggest the biggest fear of this brand is to do something wrong and be punished for it mm -hmm. um, and innocent brands promise simplicity so when you buy into something you know that it's good mm. it's just good and, yeah. and simple there's nothing harsh about it um, it's all about promoting pure being pure simple and trustworthy um, if your brand is an innocent brand, it's about being natural and unfussy. Lay it out on the table. Um, don't have a hidden agenda. So it doesn't need to be um, complicated packaging or branding or mm. you know, using really difficult language. 
not like that's not what it's about. And the brand I think that um, embodies this is QV. Yeah. So this is a brand that was created by the Queen Victoria Hospital. Um, oh, to, there you go. Yeah, I never knew that. Yeah, I know, to, to look after newborns. Um, which it, which fits so beautifully mm. into that archetype, yeah. knowing that now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I thought that anyway, but that just makes it so much stronger. Yeah, you look at you think, oh, there's, there's not a lot to that. But no. What, they, they, they do that on purpose mm. so that it's, it's about the product. Um, it's very unfussy and, you know, their advertising features pictures of babies and, you know, it's often white and using all this, yes. the symbology of being pure and innocent. So that, that's a good um, description for that one. The Sage is the next one. And the Sage brand or archetype seeks truth and wants to understand every situation. They're wise, articulate and open-minded. And Sage brands really promise wisdom, so sharing sharing that wisdom to with their the consumers um, they're about promoting learning so if your brand is a, a sage brand it's about bringing people up to their intellectual level to your yes. level okay <laughs> so you don't talk down to people but you don't expect um, you expect that the way you, you explain things you will bring people up yeah. to, to you know people People will do that. It's, you use more complicated vocabulary, be a little bit challenging, and you definitely don't apologise for it. Yep. So you, you sort of lay it out there and say, come up and enjoy what I'm enjoying. Um, and I think that ESOP really <clears throat> does that in a really mm. good way. So their website is all, I mean, it definitely has their product. Yeah. But it's all about art, ideas, intellectualism. Mm. Um, they definitely don't dumb down mm. and they don't try and be all things to everybody. Mm. If you don't get it, that's fine. Yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, they, they kind of expect their, cu their customers to get it and if they don't, well, that's okay. Yeah. And I find um, I really resonate with that brand yes. and what I find really amazing is that their retail presentation mm. is unique to the location that they're in. Mm. So you can go and um, go to the um, ESOP store in Saint-Germain in Paris yes. and it will look completely different to the one in Fitzroy in wow. St Kilda. Yes. So, you know, that whole individualism and appreciating that sense of um, integrity for location and mm. history and, and yes. ideas in that place is, um, is, is so well expressed in, yeah. in just how they they live their brand in their physical space yeah absolutely mm. Mm. yeah it's it's great um and the fact that it's stayed the same for such a long time yes. as well um is testament to its strength yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, and the final one is the explorer so the explorer is driven by adventure and wanting to discover the world for themselves they're about finding freedom and independence so moving beyond what is currently available mm -hmm. and trying something new so they promise freedom from freedom from that um, and if your brand is a an explorer brand um, it's about promoting how others can experience the new and the unknown mm. so demonstrating the journey and don't be corporate yes you know, definitely don't be corporate it's about yeah, yeah being individual yeah um, and the brand that I think um, embodies that is the the beauty chef and I don't know if you've, you've heard of that. No, I haven't show. heard of that one. No, I haven't heard of that one. It's either. a brand by a, a girl called Carla Oates. Um, she it's oh, goes, Carla. Go, goes beyond the norms of the skincare category. So it's actually about um, ingesting it. So oh, it's like powder. You yeah. can add it to smoothies or add it to... Yeah, it's not about skincare itself. No. It's about what goes inside. So oh, she's kind amazing. of amazing. Yeah, yes. but it's not done in a in a multivitamin kind of drug manufacturing no. way. Um, it's done very much in a holistic, natural way. Which, so, and as I was saying before, I'm on a detox, and so is my husband, and he's never done one before. And the first thing I noticed was his skin improve yeah. because of the different what you're body, putting into the quality it. of what he's putting into yeah. his body. Yeah. So it makes absolute sense. Yeah. So that plan. Oh, that, and that's really turning it on its head, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. It exists inside yeah. out. Yeah. 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 He's a bit of, With an own like oats. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the oats the colour oats. <laughs> 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 um, so, so, yeah, but, yeah, and it has scientific packaging. It's expensive. It has, you know, very sort of limited distribution, but absolutely you find it in vogue every, yeah, <laughs> all the time. Yeah. You find it, you know, and all of, you know, it's like very time. much championed. Like better miss extract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All those well, really obscure things. Yeah. Um, as people can buy them. Yeah, exactly. It's probably, yeah, not quite so no, uh, niche as that <laughs> now. But um, I think, yeah, she really kind of went, let's do something different in, in skincare, but it's all about the benefits of wow. skin. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a 
a good example. Now, so the 12. Yeah, now I think what we'll do now is maybe um, if you're going to talk us through um, how we can actually um, determine. Yeah, yep. and, and relate that to your brand. Now, if you've got some yes. questions, start typing them so that they're there ready for us so that we can ask those questions yes. of Janet um, once she goes through helping us relate that to our brand so that the questions are there ready to go for us. So there's a lot to sort of take in in one go. Should we go back to the, um, I think we'll go to back the wheel? To, yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. So that's all of them all together. Um, I think tips for how you can use the archetype is to, first of all, start from within. Think about yourself as a person and the archetype you identify most with most of the time. Um, and it's likely that will be translated to your brand. So, yeah, it will never bode well if you try and be something that you're not mm -hmm. um, for, your own, for your own brand. Um, and think about how you speak um, through social media, through your website. Does it all kind of fit together? Mm -hmm. And if it's if it's not fitting together, then that's something that you might want to think about um, uh, about being consistent. And I think um, the second is to think about your category. So if you are a lawyer, it's probably not going to bode well to position your brand as an innocent. People are coming to you to you know for legal reasons mm -hmm. and reparation and all yes. the rest of it, um, they're looking for strength and knowledge. Yeah. So you acting all innocent and pure and very, oh, you know, the yeah. world's a lovely place, <laughs> may not, bo you know, may not go down as well yes. with your target audience. Um, and then the last one is just be consistent. So if you're a sage, don't randomly act like a lover. So if you're being wise, <laughs> don't start being sexy um, because people probably won't you know it's a yeah. mismatch yeah um they see through it and they get or they get confused so just like people yeah we um we need to be your know, brands need to be consistent so. and i think the importance too because kylie and i both um being two people within um, the of kin brand sometimes one of us will be on instagram and the other will be on facebook yeah. so we've got to be really mindful of of being consistent as well. Yes. Um, even though we are slightly different personalities, we've got to be very aware and consistent about well, what are we as a brand. That's right. So that we're not confusing people and, and having them wonder, oh, what's is that Kylie? Is she had too many coffees today. Yeah. You know, is yeah. that Dorby? Exactly. That's right. Consistency and also understanding um, your target audience and mm. what they want from you as mm -hmm. well as a brand. So there's nothing to say that you don't you create your own your brand and you say, well, that's it. And if if I'm not going to find my audience, well, then that's tough. Yeah. You it's a it's a two way process. Mm -hmm. You really need to make sure that you are delivering what your target audience wants to hear or mm. buy or understand um, and you tweak your message accordingly. But, yeah, mm. don't go so far that you're doing something that you, it's not real yeah. or authentic. And I think we've, over the three years, we've tweaked a bit, haven't we? Yeah, I think so. Fine. And we've we've got a common language, I think, in mm. terms of how we talk about our audience and things mm. that we do mm. and, and also our visual voice in terms of our aesthetic. And, you know, we've really taken a while to find our feet in that and that will probably continue to evolve as trends yes. do as well but um, sort of being true to some of those core things has helped um, not only the words but the visual voice that we also put out there particularly yes. on Instagram as, yes. as, as um, yes as that how that platform works yeah. but um we've got a couple of questions yeah. popping up right um, and I think one of the common threads is there um, what if you feel if you are a mix of a couple of these? And I know that when I initially looked at this, I was going, oh, I think we're a bit of this and we're a bit of that and we can, you know, we can be a bit of a mm -hmm. rebel, we can feel like yeah. a bit of a rebel. Um, so any any tips for um, what happens if you if you don't strongly identify with one but, um, but can see yourself across a couple of them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, as I, as I said before, you know, we, we're human. We yeah. experience different feelings and we behave differently you know at, at different times but ultimately um, I think it would be more likely that you you'd be uh, experiencing a bits and pieces in one quadrant so you may mm. be um, you may be a, a, a caregiver and a creator um, but you're not because these that's all about seeking stability and structure and really contributing to the world in a structured way um, when you're very much the opposite and you're doing that, you feel that way just as frequently, then that's when I think um, there's 
something needs to be decided on in yes. terms of how you want to act. So as um, I think as Amy Louise asked about doing a bit of soul searching yes. to find out really where, where, does, where does my heart lie in this brand? That's right, um, yeah. yes. Yeah. Why did you get into it for the, the very beginning, the first question? Good old what, Simon Sinek's why, yeah. start with why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What made you do what you're doing right yeah. now? Yeah. And what was, you know, in terms of the, the need behind it, was your need to make the world better was it your need to create something that nobody has ever seen before mm. was your need to um, connect with other people and yeah. to find your community and yeah. do something that you enjoy together because yeah. mm. I think that's frustrating though because like I can say yes yes yes, yes. all of those things <laughs> yes. but then when I went and looked at this because um, I immediately kind of went to belonging and connection but when you were talking I mm. thought really it's about yes. understanding yes. there's something in this understanding and freedom yes. the sage and explorer quadrants is yes. really, yeah. I think, where we got to, even though I have a desire to feel like we create belonging and connection. Yes, I, I think, think that's a byproduct. Well, almost. I think that's what I think that's what is an outcome. Yes, but, that's right. But what our brand stands for is is yeah. these other things. Is this seeking and this um, exploring? Yeah. So the big question: Where do you think old kid? Six. Well, I, it's funny. Well, you probably engaged from us looking at each other while you were chatting. Yeah, I, I think that the, the sage is certainly something that yeah. you do because you, um, you're very much about, um, sh obviously you, you've built a very strong community and you, you sort of, you've galvanised that community really well, but you teach them, you bring, you bring them up to your level in terms of what your, your, your learning. Yeah. Um, you've obviously got a lot of expertise in terms of social media and your, constantly learning yeah. new things and this is a very um, dynamic category social yeah. media changes every day every day every day and you know at least <laughs> you are, was just bought by microsoft yesterday yes, i know <laughs> yeah. so if you um you know for, for the person that's not doing that every day yeah um you know you really can shortcut that knowledge and you can really help them to to yeah. to be I guess better at what they're doing yes. with their own brands. Yeah. So, so yes, but ultimately you are also connecting people together. Yes, and you know yeah. it's a very strong tribe you have, and a little bit of um, freedom explorer and the freedom. I thought we were just, but that's still in the same quadrant, so that kind of fits with what you were saying. Yep. You can probably be a little bit of something within that same quadrant. Yes. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Kim ask any tips for relating this to the furniture industry? He's a small time maker, passionate about quality, being different, creative person, passionate about the industry, sees his business as a has freedom, <laughs> joker, creator and rebel. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Great. Well, I guess um, one of the things that you can do, and, and that's fantastic to to see all of those those qualities or these those symbols yeah. within what you do. But basically what I would also do is First of all, think about again what I said. Why you decided to do what you do? What mm -hmm. what? How do you feel when you're making furniture? What is it that you're doing, and what ultimately what do you want to the, your furniture to represent? Mm -hmm. But then the other is to actually, you know, no man is an island. We all operate in you know in communities, and brands operate within segments and categories. So um, look at your competitors and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you are you know, there's freedom furniture on one side, yeah. very big and very kind of for everybody, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and then there so is maybe the dove of possibly. Yeah. You know, they um, possibly um, they, they'd definitely be on that side of the on the, the stability. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but then there are you know, if you are creating furniture and it's all handmade and it's all very unique and you're really Aesthetic. trying to push the boundaries in terms of you know aesthetics then I would say that that's quite different um, and that that's a good thing. So the further you can pull yourself apart from mm. the others mm. is, is good. Stand stand alone yeah. um, because then people have a stronger reason to buy you and not another mm. another brand. You, you're not as easily replicable. Yes, um, and that's a big thing. I mean, yeah. for for an individual independent maker, yeah. that, that independence, um, is that's the defining factor yeah. is that it's often bespoke and it's commissioned yes. and... Mm. You know, it's it's not you're not going to see it everywhere. Absolutely. Else. So, and that's to be celebrated. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it, there's nothing wrong with being funny if that's part of your personality is to be to be funny with that. Or, um, yeah. You know, there are there are obviously different layers that you can put onto it. But yes. yeah, you, 
I think the more that you can sort of stand for something distinctly, yeah, the easier people will connect with you. Yeah, I, it brings to mind the Bellroy brand. Yes, mm. I don't know. Um, and Jack. Yeah, mm. but that that was a, it's a wallet category, and they kind of they re redesigned a wallet, so yes. it was a slim carrying wallet mm. that could fit in a pocket. But their personality that they had behind the brand and about you know spending the week down in. Bells Beach and the weekend up in Fitzroy so they could have the best of both worlds and how yeah. they got Bellroy and telling that story with some humour and humility but also um, some, you know, street credibility yeah. is kind of, you know, I see it as sort of being that freedom brand but yeah. still with that kind of, I don't know, with, with some of the other characteristics but, yes. yeah, interesting. Um uh, Kim also asks, are you better to stay true long term or adapt more to change? Yeah, well, that's it's a very interesting question. Um, I think it is ultimately better to stay true long term as long as the playing field is the same. So if things change and your, you move, your product changes or the entire category changes, then it's probably time to look at what you're doing. Um, an example, going back to female pop music, was, um, do you remember Miley Cyrus a few years ago? Oh, yes. She was the sweet little innocent girl mm. who was on Disney or something like that. Yeah, and she was she, Hannah Montana. Hannah, yes. that's it, yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden she went to one MTV Music Awards and blew that completely out of the water mm. and she did it on purpose and then she has stuck to that mm. since. So she's had to, she caused a massive kind of readjustment mm. and reperception of her. She grew up. And, and, people, and all the parents are not dying out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, she, she, that was a very deliberate thing and at the yeah. time, you know, everyone was like, oh, no, she's yes. ruined it for herself for, yeah. you know, forever. And she, but she has stuck to what she stands for mm. now and that's very, very different to what she was as a, as a young good girl. Yes. So um, I think, and the reason why is because she wants to move into a different area mm -hmm. and, and be perceived different, mm. differently. So I think there's there's a lot to be said for both, but I think ultimately once you decide on your architect archetype, sorry, you need to really stick to that and um, because consistency is what people trust. Mm. And I suppose you've also got to um, start that with if you've done the work to actually think about it and define it properly in the first place. Yep. Um, so if you haven't dug deep, like you were saying before, and, and asked those questions of why did I do this, you know, what am I trying to achieve out of it, you may be pitching to the wrong archetype from the outset. Yes, that's right. Mm, and who you're going to. Um, so Katie, hi Katie, Riddle asked, um, this is a very interesting topic, how does aspirational fit in with this? If you're an aspirational, if you are, if you are, are aspiring, and an aspirational brand, I guess, in aspiring to a certain kind of lifestyle or... Yeah. Um, um, well, if we can get some clarification on exactly what, what you mean, Katie, that would be great. So aspirational in terms of is you are you aspiring to be one of these archetypes and you aren't there already or is it about aspiring or aspirational is that, brands? Or is which it is the um, customer aspiring? Yeah, yeah. So perhaps something like um, you wouldn't necessarily say Dove is an aspirational brand. Right. Um, because it, or QV potentially. Yeah, like so it, it's a matter of how you perceive it. So yeah. aspirational perhaps. meaning uh, more expensive or premium or um, boundary pushing. Yeah, or maybe it's how you would like to see yourself Yes. and relate to those brands in that way rather than actually how, how you are? Well, I think with the whole idea of an archetype is that you recognise the story and you connect with it on a sub, subconscious level. Like yeah. you really kind of understand, like you don't need to see it again and again mm. to really understand what it's about. Yeah. And I think... Um, yeah, so fine. Katie was just um, clarifying then. She said that for the customer to be aspiring to be part of that brand... So I think that probably yeah. works more on premium brands, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, well, I think it absolutely makes sense. As long as what you're saying uh, is something that you can connect with. So, yeah, um, yeah as, as aspiring, uh, a, brand, a brand should never sort of be um, inaccessible. You know, yeah. The brand mm -hmm. needs to be um, accessible by its target audience, mm -hmm. regardless of who that is. And it, not aspir aspirational brands may... Um, you know, they may be more expensive or they may have fewer people buying into them because for many reasons. But yeah. ultimately, they stand for an archetype or they stand for a character that people 
um, resonate with. Yeah. yeah. So it, wor it works across every sort of market segment, whether it's aspirational or it's bargain basement. There's mm. a, a need for you to, to choose that brand over another. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Amy Louise um, asks, so I started my business to create beautiful things and bring the beauty of the world into my jewellery. Does this fit along the lines of intimacy like Mac or discovery of the natural world like the explorer? Mm, very good question. <laughs> what do you think, Amy? I would like yeah. to, I'd, I'd like to, to know, uh, maybe it needs to come back to why did you start making jewellery in the first place, yes. like what you're saying. Yep. So, and I loved that question that you asked is how do you feel when you're actually engaged mm. in that work? Um, because I was actually writing something last night and I reflected back on the very first time we ran a content marketing workshop in Sydney mm. and I had this moment in the, in the middle of the afternoon and I just stood there and I thought, wow, we're actually doing this. We're actually, you know, sharing what we know with people and mm. it's going really well and it's resonating yes. with people. Mm. And it was that feeling of sharing what I know yes. with others mm. um, that, you know, that lit me up. And, and that it comes back to the stage. Yes, yes that's mm. right. And so, and, and, but why did we run a, want to run workshops in the first place? And it was because we had all this knowledge mm. trapped in these corporate offices yeah. that we wanted to share with yeah. so many other people. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, it, that, that for me. Um, and haven't you done a good job? Oh, you really, <laughs> you really <laughs> have. But, you know, and it's the same idea, I guess, running webinars and yeah. doing courses and all of that kind of stuff. It's kind of, you know, we love sharing what we know is what we, is one of our, is yes. one of our big taglines. And I think it comes down to that innate feeling that we had um, of why, why do we want to do this? Why do this rather than yeah. actually taking on the management of people's social media yes. or, you know, just, or, you know, going and working for someone else in yeah. the area of social media. So, yeah, I think it was really interesting um, to, um, to when you said, "Well, what, why did you do that?" and and what what feeling do you have when you're yep. doing it? That mm -hmm. really helped me solidify when we're going through these twelve archetypes where we sat. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's a that's an, well, yeah, and I think well to, to Amy Louise's point about um, about jewelry, um, mm -hmm. I think it comes down to you know, are you creating the jewelry to share it with? People share your your love of beautiful things with people, or is it about you personally? You know, creating things that you find enjoyment from you in particular. So it's my, one is more um, individual, and the other, I suppose, is more about sharing that beauty with other people. Yeah, yeah. Would you, <laughs> she said would both. You, <laughs> would you say that if it's if it's sharing with other people, that would be more sage because it's it's giving them exposure to that. Yeah, or and the explorer and bringing them to yeah. that vision of how she sees the world through jewellery. Yeah, well, she's um, trying, yeah, she sees the world, jewellery in a, in a different yes. way and she, it's about sort of creating that and yeah. bringing it to life because for the pure reason that she loves it and, it, you know, it's about being creative. Whereas on yeah. the other hand, it's about sharing that and making people feel it. You yes. know, are they enjoying the texture or the colour or how does that make them feel? feel sexier or yes. more confident if they wear it, yeah. um, which would make it more of a lover yes. archetype. Yeah. So can I ask, when you work with brands, yes. how, do you, how do you get them to work out where they are on this wheel? Um, it's a process of going or When through, you create brands from scratch. Yeah, well, creating brands from scratch is, is a different thing. Um, it's basically, as I said, look, surveying the marketplace. Obviously, you start with the brand with your product or your service or whatever it is that you're selling um, and determine, you know, what what need does it fill? What what do people need? Um, do you often work with founders? I, I do, indeed. Yeah, yeah. I do. Um, so, therefore, again, ask them the same question, what, you know, why yeah. did you start it and what do you love about your business? What really gets you going about it um, every day? Why do, you, why do you turn up to work every day? What mm. makes it? And that's the story. And a lot of, yeah. we find in our yeah. workshops, so many people hide that story. Mm. They don't think anyone would be interested in it and that it doesn't really have a meaning for yes. their brand. They, they feel scared to be vulnerable enough mm. to tell their authentic story. Yeah, and that's the most that's what, I think that's intriguing, intriguing thing. Yes. See, I get goosebumps yeah. now yeah. just talking about it. When I, If someone starts telling the story behind their brand, I'm just like, 
Yes. Always That's why we're always about the about page. Yes. You're about yes. us page on your website. It needs yes. to have your beautiful face. It needs to have your story. And it reminds me of a quote by Brene Brown. And she says, you know, when we, when we talk about vulnerability, it's mm. the first thing I look for in you, mm. but the last thing I want to show of myself. Yes. And it's like, so it, and that's yeah. that kind of breaking that down. But that's what a brand is. A mm. brand has to stand for something. It has to be vulnerable enough to yep. stand for something. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, and brands are like people. We, we want to know yes. more about them. Mm. Yes, um, well, they're characters, as you said. They are. Yeah. 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 So, so creating brands, start, you know, you start with the need, why, why it does what it does, I suppose, or why, why your product or service does what it does. Um, and then it's also about looking at the marketplace as well. Where are the gaps? Where are people becoming... Um, where is there an opportunity? There may be a br no brands at all acting like a joker in the skincare category because everybody's so serious mm. about, oh, it must make me look younger and mm. feel better. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah, for a brand to come in and say, hey, we're young, we're fun, we're all about just having a good time and, yeah. you know, life is all about, you know, enjoyment, just yeah. smile. Yeah. There, uh, that's a lot to be said for connecting with that because it's yeah. it's pure and, you know, yeah. it's easy to do so. So, yeah. you know, they've, they've gone in and done very well mm. because of that. Um, so yeah, there's a there's strategy, but there's also feeling, and that's what I love yeah. most about marketing. It's yes, it's, yes. it's technical, but it's creative and it's analytical. Yeah. But yeah, it all it's the perfect art and science. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, does anyone else have any more questions? Because I think we're about to wrap up. We've had a, such a lovely discussion, yeah, and it's, it's been, been so wonderful. insightful. Um, and it really makes me think, you know, tying in with our I Believe exercise, like if I was to go back and, and have a look at our I Believe exercise that we do, which is really tapping into that limbic brain, which is, mm. you know, that 80% unconscious part of the brain yes. um, or that subconsciously um, drives us to our purchasing behaviour. I, you know, I would like to see the the mapping of my I believes against, yeah. you know, against where it fits on on the archetype traits. Yes, that yes. could be something really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to have the um, the archetype diagram as a download um, on the show notes after we publish um, this website. So yes. we'll have that, we'll have that up on, a, on one of our blogs yeah. on the Ofkin website. And obviously, um, there's all Janet's contact details. So if you wanted to email Janet, it's Janet at passionfolk.com. Yeah, and I've, e email me anything. I'd love to love to have a chat. Um, <laughs> yeah, obviously, she's I'm quite, quite yeah. smile on her face. She's very passionate. She's about definitely her. one of our kind yeah. of people. Yeah. Let's have a chat. <laughs> I do. And and on Instagram, passionfolk, Facebook, passionfolk, Twitter, passionfolk. That's nice and easy. Yes, passionfolk.com. Yes. And um, apart from loving discussions about archetypes, um, Passion Folk can also deal with marketing management, new product development, communication, coaching and brand activation. So a real powerhouse. Yeah, absolutely. We have one quick question from Amy um, Doran who says sh that she has a store, so her brand isn't a product, but a combination of what we sell and service and how do archetypes apply to that situation? I mean, it, really, it's your curation of the products exactly that you bring. Exactly, I was about to say. Yeah. That's exactly the word. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, an, a, an independent store, like a uh, small boutique is going to feel very different to Maya. Yes. Um, because Maya is much more about the regular the regular consumer and bringing everybody in and yeah. uh, being quite egalitarian, I suppose, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, a little tiny um, store in uh, Smith Street in Fitzroy is yes. going to feel a lot different. And yeah. that you, you look, think about the archetype for that little store and it's more likely to be a, a, an explorer or something. Yeah. Similar. So, again, it comes back to why do you choose the products that you choose in your store over any others? Um, and also looking at your store layout or your store colours or the name of your store, all of those things are parts of a character that yes. are building um, one of your archetypes. So, you definitely have a brand in your own store yeah. um, that, that would stand for something. So, um, we've had one more question. Shani. I'm a psychodramacist, which is... Which I've never heard of. I but think I know who you are now, Shani. I think <laughs> I remember me. I'm a psycho psychodramacist, which is something that intrigues but also unnerves people. It can be a therapeutic and healing process or creative and innovative, depending on the setting or people I'm working with. I'm looking to connect people more with themselves um, and to be more creative um, using role play. Is it a matter of choosing one angle to begin with and allowing the others to take its course as I build my brand? I am drawn to the caregiven 
naturally, but I'm also wanting people to be more of an explorer as they realise they can be in control in their sense of well-being. It's a very empowering process and it makes me feel so validated knowing that they've discovered themselves. So wow. I think I met Shani um, a couple of weeks ago and I think, am I right, Shani, in saying that you um, have a background in acting? And you actually help, um, it's a therapeutic play um, process through um, role play mm -hmm. to help people overcome some of the things that are in their life. Yeah, wow. great. Mm. That's fantastic. Well, and she's very bubbly and vibrant and fun <laughs> and gorgeous. And yes. Well, that's great. Well, Shani, if you're drawn to the caregiver archetype, then that really, that there's a lot to be said for that being what you should stand for. doesn't need mean that you need to be, um, you know, overly, um, I don't know, I don't know what the words might be. Somber? Somber or, or serious or, or, yeah, or not afraid to sort of ask the tough questions or push yes. people out of their comfort zone because you're doing it from a place of care and you yes. want people to, to really, you know, get the best out of life. And um, you pushing people into that experience to an explorer archetype is not necessarily always going to work because people are always going to feel to be different. If they're if you're drawn to a caregiver archetype, someone else might very much be a lover mm -hmm. or an innocent. And it's about making sure that they explore that and their authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I guess you you need to um, to work with everybody individually. But your brand, if you feel that you are a caregiver, then that's absolutely what you um, should articulate and push for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that makes total sense because what they might get out of it is up to them. But where yep. you position yourself is in helping walk people through that process yes. in that caregiving idea and that supportive structured and yes. able to take risks in a safe way. Yeah, that's right. That makes total sense. It's about yeah, being, protecting them, making them feel safe um, and, and supported and just mm -hmm. yeah, able to go where they may not have been before. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I feel like we had awesome. a breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're done for today. So thank you again, Janet. Oh, thanks. Um, against Pleasure. all odds, you made it in here. <laughs> and you can now probably, can you go home and have a sleep? Oh, I wish. No, back to the office. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure. And I have to say I'm very, very... Um, Flattered that you asked me to be part of this. Oh, it's, so, it's been so much yeah. fun. We can yeah. talk for hours. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, again, if you wanted to grab a copy of um, the archetype diagram, then jump on to the Obkin website and go. Not quite now. No, not later. Yet. And um, and there'll be a blog post there where you can download that. And I'll also watch this recording. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for dropping by today. And um, we've loved sharing all your questions and, and tapping you. into Janet's wisdom. So. Yeah. And Janet would love to hear from you. So if you'd like to explore further. Drop She's a line. whiz. Yes. Oh, total and, whiz. Um, we'll see you next month. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.